is going on everybody? My name is Payne and welcome back to another anime review video and I've been meaning to make this for a couple of reasons. The first one is that there are people that I know who have seen this show that are huge fans of it. It's the first time in a while that I've made a video, non-Ghibli related, that I've talked about a show or a movie that other people have watched or I've known that other people have watched. It's just, it's just been like an isolated thing basically. And uh, the second reason is that this is kind of a challenge for me. And to that, I say challenge accepted. Because for anyone who's never heard of this show before, there is a lot to unpack from the light novels and the 13 episode anime series. It's just, there's just a lot to it. And I absolutely love it. And I mean the story. There's a lot of stuff to unpack with uh, the characters, the story, how the plot unfolds, the music in the anime, everything about it, I just absolutely just adore. And considering that the next Ghibli review video that I'm going to make has a lot to it, I might as well have some practice here. So here is the one and the only Bakano. Bakano is an adventure, mystery, and supernatural anime series that is directed by Takahiro Omori, produced by Shuko Yokoyama, and written by Noburo Takagi. It was made by a small anime studio known as Brains Base, and it came out in the summer of 2007 with 13 episodes and three OVAs to its name. The anime was based off of a light novel series that was started by a college student named Ryogo Narita, who currently has 22 volumes out of Bakano since 2003. Uh, he made it out of a desire to make a light novel that was set mainly in the Prohibition era here in the United States because there weren't any light novels out that were set during that time. And while he was writing the first volume, he was getting inspiration from numerous books and movies and was able to mix fictional elements with historical events in order to create a uniquely smooth plot. So after the publication of the first volume of Bakano came out in 2003, Narita was asked by his chief editor not to write the second volume uh, in order for him to finish college because he had six months left. But when he finished college, he got right back on the Bakano train, no pun intended, to where he wrote over 400 pages in the second volume and listed the price of his second volume supposedly at 700 yen or if you... Uh, converted to U.S. dollars at $6.36, which at the time was considered to be a little much for something uh, from a newcomer in the scene. And it actually freaked him out because uh, he didn't know if people were going to buy it because it was priced at a pretty expensive rate at 700 yen, especially for someone who was just bursting onto the scene. So he and his chief editor decided to cut the second volume into two parts, and ever since, he has been getting inspiration to write more from what he changed, especially on the first volume of the light novel, which, to put it simply, to not draw out onto a tangent or anything, it was a way completely different story than what we have right now. As for the anime production, the, uh, most of the members of the studio Brainspace, including the art director Ido Satoshi, traveled to New York City so they can accurately portray the area in the anime. They went to different places like Manhattan, Brooklyn, and then they went outside of New York City to the Steamtown National Historic Site in Scranton, Pennsylvania to accurately create a few steam locomotives, which, for people who've never seen Bacchano before, is a very key setting in the anime. And when it came to the writing, rather than attempting attempting to write a confused scenario from the beginning, uh, the writer, Noboru Takagi, decided to write the script directly and then make adjustments along the way uh, with every twist and turn in the story, with every uh, chronological story break. And because of that, it took over a year for his script to be finally finished since he had to constantly revise it with every time break, with every uh, break to the past or break to the future, he had to constantly change it, and it turned to this daunting task, but he was able to get the job done. And and during the making of Bakano, the director, Takahiro Omori, knew that the way that Bakano was set up was completely new territory, not only for uh, such a small studio like Brainspace, but in anime in general. And even though he had that in mind, he believed that the that you know any larger studio like A1 or Kyoto Animation may not have allowed uh, previous episodes to be altered when future episodes were already underway, just like what they did with the show. 
And another key part, I don't normally mention stuff from this side of the anime, but uh, I just found some pretty interesting things that, uh, that of course, has to be mentioned, because not only does this have to do with Bakano, but it also has to do with the English dub distributor Funimation, uh, and it's ADR director Tyler Walker, who said that because of the number of characters that the show had and that the number of them were mainly older men, it made the casting process fairly difficult. And what he did was that to try and write the script, he would watch numerous gangster movies and then movies from the 1930s so he could learn the lingo and the rhythm of the time period. And then when auditions came around, it was, according to Walker, even still today, the longest casting process Funimation has ever held with a span of six days for 18 spots and 140 people showed up to audition. And in the end, we got what, uh, according to some fans of the show, one of the best anime dubs ever made. Now, again, for anyone who's seen the show before, you know very well that there is a lot to the story, which is kind of surprising considering that for people who don't know, even for people who've seen the Bakano anime, the Bakano anime covers the first four volumes of the light novel. Keep in mind that there are 22 volumes in the light novel total as of the making of this video, and the anime only covers the first four. So what I'm going to do is explain what happens in the anime as much as I can because it's been a while since I've seen it. I've tried to, to re-watch it, so I'm getting as much as I can. Uh, I may not get everything in the anime. Uh, there's a couple of things that I may get in the light novel. <laughs> I honestly don't know for sure, uh, but you know what? Maybe in the end, you know, this may be a good thing because there may be people who would want to watch Bakano and doesn't want the whole thing spoiled for him. So uh, I'm going to explain as simple as I can the plot from the Bakano anime, especially some key points from it, uh, both just explain the story as well as I'm going to talk about my opinions on a number of the characters as well. Because if I'm going to get into the light novels and the number of manga that came out after the original light novel came out, there would be no way that this video would come out today. So I'm just going to make it as simple as I possibly can again. Again, uh, I don't know if I actually said this. I don't know why I'm saying again, again, but spoilers. You have been warned of Bakano. For anyone who wants to see Bakano, go watch it right now and then come back. For people who don't care, you keep watching. So the story of Bakano begins in the year 1711 when a group of alchemists led by Maiza Avaro, not those type of alchemists, summon a demon that gives them an elixir of immortality and the, and the method of killing someone who consumes the elixir of immortality. But due to the strength of the elixir, the alchemists agree that no one else should take the elixir outside of the group of alchemists that are there. And everyone agrees except for a man named Solard Quates. Later that night, in anger out of everyone else's decision, Solard kills a number of alchemists and it forces the rest of them to separate into different parts of the world to avoid getting killed. Fast forward to over 200 years later in 1930, where Solard successfully recreates the elixir before it is stolen by a young thug named Dallas Genoard and his group of thieves who unknowingly spread the elixir after bringing it to a party for Misa's protege named Firo Prochienzo, I hope I said that right, uh, who is a member of the Martillo family, which is an Italian mafia syndicate. But because that Dallas stole the elixir, Solard made Dallas and his group an incomplete immortal when he drinks it, meaning that he will live forever, but he will still age. And among the other people who consumed it, thinking that it was alcohol, included the rest of the Martillo family. Uh, the three Gandor brothers, who are an American mafia sy syndicate, who are actually after Dallas Genoard, and easily the two stupidest thieves in all of anime by a long shot, whose names are Isaac Dean and Miria Harvitt. At the party, Firo falls in love with Solard's homunculus uh, assistant, known as Ennis, who then betrays Solard by telling Firo how to kill him, to which he does. And after the party, the three Gando brothers find and capture Dallas and his group and cement him in a barrel and throw him into the bottom of the Hudson River because supposedly he and his group killed a number of Gandor family members during a previous robbery. Fast forward to 1931, where one of the Gandor brothers, Luck Gandor, asks his adoptive brother, a train conductor and psychotic killer named Claire Stanfield, to board a train to New York, to which he does. And shortly after, boards a train known as, get this, the Flying Pussyfoot. That is not a joke. 
I am not making any offensive joke whatsoever. That is the actual name of the train. After a while, the train is then hijacked by the Russo and Lemur gangs who are trying to kidnap a senator's family on the train, and a battle ensues between the two gangs. Meanwhile, a third gang comes in, lead, led by Jacuzzi Splots and Nice Holy Stone, uh, as they attempt to protect the passengers and fight the hijackers, while Claire assumes the identity of a monster that eats trains passengers known as the Rail Tracer. And with that in mind, slaughters much of the Russo and Lemoore gangs. Claire then stops his rampage and proposes to a woman named Shane Laforette, who is the uh, daughter of Huey Laforette, who is one of the original immortals and is working with uh, Jacuzzi and Nice. And a serial stowaway and newspaper field agent named Rachel flees Claire as she was about to get killed and ends up helping Jacuzzi and Nice in the rescue of the hostages. The last remaining members of the Lemoore are eventually defeated by Jacuzzi's gang, uh, while a sadistic murderer named Lad Russo, the Russo gang, is incarcerated and loses his arm to Claire Stanfield. While at the same time, Ennis writes to Isaac and Miria, inviting them to Manhattan. Uh, that, that's the reason why they are on the plane as well. They board the same train and they meet Jacuzzi, and they unwittingly sway an immortal named Sesla Meyer, who is actually, if I had to say, probably 10 years old. Uh, they unwittingly sway him from trying to bring bombs on the train and use them in a drug war in New York. But the train arrives in the new year in New York in 1932, with the survivors going their separate ways. Jacuzzi and Nice, they escape custody and go into hiding after their base, in, the base of operations in Chicago is taken over by the Russo family. An information gatherer, Rachel, from the newspaper, returns to her newspaper, The Daily Days, mostly unscathed. And Isaac and Miria introduce Cess to the Martillo family, and is subsequently adopted by Firo and Ennis, who later marry as the latter's brother. And as for Claire Stanfield, he begins his mission to exterminate the enemies of his adopted brothers and the... Uh, the Gandor brothers, uh, with his intentions to find Shane and marry her after the job is done. Again, I heavily apologize if I miss anything. This was very challenging to find, and, uh, you know, I, I, I think there are some people out there who may have more information. I just tried to avoid what was only in the light novel, and then I tried to keep it what's in the show, because this is an anime review. This isn't a light novel review. If this was a light novel review, it would be, like, this video would be twice as long. So instead of a typical plot structure, Narita created the story around how the characters would act, which changed the original plots and structures of the light novels. And although he allows the characters to move how they want, he finds it hard to do because there would be characters that would move too much and they would ruin the plot. And in addition to that, other characters, uh, in his opinion, would be hard to move along with the plot. And as for the story, once you get past the fact that you jump in the middle of a storyline a few times, it turns into a fast-paced, entertaining plot that grabs you for more and makes you keep asking, what's next on Bacchano? One of the things about the characters that I really have grown to like in Bacchano is that for the large number of characters that are in the anime, they are all different in terms of appearance and, and personality, which helps me differentiate who's who in a show where that's normally hard to do. Most of the characters also accurately represent prominent figures from the 1930s Prohibition era during, the, uh, during that real time period, uh, like how all the gangs in the show portray real time mafia gangs from the 1930s, and the most famous one uh, being that Isaac and Miria, uh, they are inspired by the infamous Bonnie and Clyde which is a surprise to no one. There's also a few characters that really stick out that I just want to give a quick summary to. Uh, the first one is, speaking of which, Isaac and Miria. And while they aren't my favorite characters in the anime, their ability to make me laugh with every dumb thing they think of and every dumb thing they do is very priceless. For people who don't know or have never seen the show before, picture Isaac and Miria as the type of people who would think that one way to evade the cops is to dress up as each other. Yeah, that, that's how dumb they are. Another one is Luck Gandor, uh, the youngest of the three Gandor brothers. The thing that really sticks out uh, to me with Luck is that, well, first, out of the three, he gets more screen time, but he also is self-aware that he has this anger issue and that he is one of those people who's calm on the outside but is absolutely ruthless uh, on the inside, which, again, makes him stand out from the other two brothers. 
There's Dallas Jedward who treats everybody like shit, and therefore I hate him for that. And actually, one character that I didn't mention in the plot because I couldn't find a place to put her in is actually Dallas's little sister, Eve Jedward, uh, who during the anime worries about Dallas when he goes missing, but then after a while opens up about how she never really liked him and how she would be verbally abused by him, which at the end of the day, it makes me just hate that piece of shit even more. Next up is Jacuzzi Splot and Nice Holy Stone. Jacuzzi is my favorite character in the entire anime because he comes off as a manly wimp. Not only does he get scared easily to the point where he just cries easily, but when he has to spring into action, like when he has to kill someone, he'll do it in a heartbeat. Again, even when he cries while doing it, and nice holy stone to me is just someone who is just a very trustworthy partner is always uh by jacuzzi's side and is always uh <clears throat> and is always uh always jumps up to the punch as well and finally it's the man himself claire stanfield aka vino aka the rail tracer his philosophy is that he can't be killed because everyone that he meets are just figments of his imagination and that he couldn't imagine the world without him in it. Basically, to put it simply, this guy is a psycho. This guy is crazy. Anybody who thinks that this guy is the best husbando in any form of media ever is insane. And should probably lay off of the Prosecco. I'm, I'm just saying. That's just a suggestion. The animation in Bakuno is very well done, which says a lot considering that it was done by a small studio like Brainspace. The action scenes were neatly made and they used their color palette wisely for the dramatic moments in the show. Finally, the sound in Bakuno is just out of this world. Not only do you have the script filled with lingo from the po Prohibition era in the dub, but the opening, which is Guns N' Roses by Paradise Lunch, is something straight out of the 1930s, with it mainly consisting of a jumpy jazz instrumental. And while I do think this is one of my absolute favorite openings, I don't think this is, uh, you know, make the opening your ringtone catchy. I, I mean, you know, I, I wouldn't really go far with an opening like that anyway. As for the voice acting, again, Bakano is considered to be one of the best dubs ever made, and it's because of how much additional diversity uh, that the voice actors give to an already diverse and varied cast, which makes it ten times more memorable. And after looking at all the things that Bakuno really had to offer, I, I just gotta conclude with the fact that, in my opinion, Bakuno is a rarity in anime. Uh, it's a show that successfully merges comedy, suspense, action, and even a little romance without sacrificing animation or sound quality. It really shows that Umori and Brainspace really took their time when making this. And in the end, we got a show that, like a number of its characters, never gets old. And with that, I'm going to give Bakano a perfect 10 out of 10. Thank you guys for watching this Bakano anime review video. If you liked this video, hit the like button down below. If you want to see more anime review videos in the future, you can hit the subscribe button on the screen down in the description. Uh, and also uh, down right next to my channel. Also, if you want to see any anime review videos that I've made in the past, this is what I meant to say with the description. There are links to videos in the description, as well as all of them in my channel. Uh, is there also, there's also four of them on the screen as well. So with that out of the way, my name is Payne, and uh, I'll see you when I review Princess Mononoke, because I'm, I'm not hiding it anymore. The next review is Princess Mononoke, and I'm hyped for it.